Hello and welcome to another episode of Through an Opaque Lens with me, Niall Murphy. And here I'm coming from my uh, my nearest jungly bit again. It is the 13th of April 2024 as I speak and I hope to be able to get this up tonight. Um, so what I wish to speak about today, I'm calling this religions, quasi-religions and ideologies. Yes, because I kind of feel pretty much ideologically homeless in this world at the moment because I'm very much, um, you know, in this kind of way, um, an ideological loner. Um, and as I look around and I see what is going on, and I see what people are buying into, you know, this is a time of uh, balkanized tribalism. And um, there ain't any that I want to join. No, I'm not in your tribe, but remember that. And I am one of these not in your, not in your tribe lone wolf types in this world. And uh, so I'm going to go through and I'm going to be talking about all the different, um, or just, I've done some bullet points, shall I say. I've done some bullet points where I'm going to be going through a few different ideologies, whether they be actual religions, whether they just be political ideologies that act like quasi-religions, whether they be, you know, what I say, things that are not normally considered to be religions, but behave as if they are so. And um, start with that. So the first um, on my list of bullet points, of course, is... Um, Islamism with ism in the brackets because I want to differentiate. Now, of course, just like I've met many Christians that I like and got on with, I've met many Muslims that I like and have got on with. And on an individual to individual basis, I'm not going to decide to tar everyone with the same brush. I mean, one, uh, when it comes to famous or reasonably famous people, a couple of them come to mind. One is uh, Majid Nawaz, who uh, you know, decided to be a heretic and go off script when he was working for LBC Radio. And then um, started talking about, uh, what to say, the lurgy, the vaccines and all of that stuff. And as a result, um, LBC didn't like him anymore, so he lost his job and got cancelled. And ever since then, he's been speaking out against the globalists. Uh, so, you know, he's still uh, a Muslim, but um, at the same time, he... Uh, He's one of these people who's friendly to Christians and Jews and all of that, and um, has uh, kind of become aware of a big picture where he doesn't want people to be played off against each other and fair play to him, I say, you know? Another one is um, someone who goes by the name of the Imam of Peace. And you know what? The funny thing about it is that I've seen the Imam of Peace in conversation with Tommy Robinson. They seem to get on and they have no issue with each other. I haven't seen him in all that many interviews, and at one time that I did see him in an interview, he was talking about how um, what is needed is for a very influential imam um, who's respected by the entire Muslim community to be able to come out and to declare a fatwa against the violent verses in the Quran. And I thought, well, if that could be done, that would be a form of reformation, which actually might get rid of this problem that we're having at the moment with a clash of civilizations. I would also say, from what I can tell, with countries, prosperous countries in the Gulf states, say for instance, and the UAE in particular, that a lot of people um, are going there to get away from the West, you know, and um, you know, it seems to be a place where a lot of people like to escape to, should we say, for whatever reasons, you know. But, um, you know, uh, but they usually find that more tolerant than they do to be in Europe right now. And now my main issue, of course, is what is going on in Europe. Um, I would not say that this is the entirety of Islam because I say, you know, I've met quite a few of them that I get on with and I have no issue with as individuals. But, you know, how can I say? 9 11 is a good example. Now, I know that the truth is out there and a lot of people are going to have their internal dialogue filled with them. It was an inside job, right? Please don't comment in my comment section to tell me. 9-11 was an inside job because you are completely missing the point of what I'm about to say. I don't know what happened on 9-11. To me, it's an insoluble mystery. I am sceptical of a lot of what happened on that day. But that's not the point. The point is that the um, official narrative that comes from the mainstream media, even to this day, was that it was Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda. Now, if that's the case, right, um, that the official version is saying that, regardless of whether any of these things were or were not false flags, that's the point I'm making. So, you go back to hmm, the late 1980s. Was it the mid-1980s, late 1980s? Salman Rushdie, um, who himself was a Muslim, 
Um, you know, who is a Muslim, even to this day, because, I mean, you know, they didn't manage to kill him recently. They did injure him, of course, and he's now only got one eye. But anyway, back in the day when he wrote the Satanic Verses, um, Ayatollah Khomeini uh, of Iran at the time declared a fatwa against him, and he had to go into hiding for many years, right? And he thought he was all right up until only, was it a couple of years ago, when some nutter decided to get on stage and stab him. He now only has one eye as a result of it, but he's still a brave man and still, you know, speaks out. All he done was write a book, you know, and I mean, I don't know, I don't really fully understand it. It's coming from an Indian perspective, if you like, because he's an Indian Muslim. So I don't really understand what the problem is myself. I, you know, I mean, <laughs> that's the thing. But uh, that was definitely a red flag for people in the Western world when, you know, the, the, when MI5 at the time had to put him in hiding because there were a lot of very dangerous people who wanted to kill him. And, um, and then, of course, you know, things kind of got even worse because, as I say, 9-11, whether you believe it or not, you know, the official story or not, doesn't come into it. The fact is that since then, we've had a variety of things happening. I mean, 7-7, a lot of people say that was a false flag as well, but again, come down to a bunch of people who were a member of a certain religion, as well as um, what happened in, a lot of things happened in France, the Bataclan, for instance. Um, you know, there was a whole load of things that were all organized at the same time to happen in there. Um, and then in Nice, a few years earlier, of course, you had, uh, you know, someone in a lorry going out and plowing loads of people. So you've had lots of um, attacks involving, you know, men driving lorries to plough over people. There was an attack on Westminster Bridge, there was one on London Bridge. Uh, um, there was, you know, there'd been plenty of people going around. I mean, there'd been plenty of beheadings in France, as well as stabbings and all these things that were supposed to be done in the name of, uh, how to say, a certain version of God, shall we say. And um, as a result, there is a danger that was never there for us before. But now, it appears, we're not allowed to speak out against that danger because all the nuance has been taken out of the conversation and therefore there are some people peddling the idea that you can only be Islamophobic if you criticise these dangers that are happening. But like I said at the beginning of the video, I've met lots of um, Muslims who I got on with who I was okay with, including one who was English. I think he was a member of that old psychedelic band in the 1960s, the Pink Fairies, who came before the Canterbury scene, who you know, uh, we had bands like Caravan and um, Soft Machine and from that in the 1970s with the space rock era that led to Gong and Steve Hillage and all of that. So he was part of that scene. I met him, had a chat with him at Breaking Convention, the old um, psychedelics conference back in the day. He seemed like a nice man. You know, like he was kind of like the, the Muslim equivalent of like one of those Hindu babas. I was talking to him about a few, you know, what would seem to be controversial issues and he was cool. You know, he wasn't there to preach the Quran. He was there to talk about um, the space rock scene or the psychedelic scene in the 1960s. He didn't bring any of this stuff up at all. And, you know, he was just be basically being a normal human being. So I know that there, it is potentially redeemable. And I know that Christianity went through this in the past, but that's not the problem that I have. The problem that I had is that because of the fear of being racist, we have to f forgive me for these shafts of sunlight coming through. It's close to sunset at the, at the moment and um, I've got a bit of a funny angle and I'm sheltering myself under these uh, banana leaves at the moment. So I might just get some odd bits of light coming on me. Forgive me for that. So yeah, um, back to what I was saying, right? Is that the problem that we have is that because of the West's fear of racism, the problem with the West's wokeness, is it will not wake up and smell the coffee, does not understand that whatever is happening is that a certain group of people do seem to be intent on taking over the Western world, it, taking over Europe in particular, and not really got as much of a foothold in America. And these people, these, um, how could I say, these more fundamentalist nutters are not welcome in other countries like, like the Gulf states, like the UAE or Kuwait or places like that. They won't have them there. And, and if you were gonna to talk to someone from those places, you can have these conversations with them and they don't, they don't mind. They don't consider it blasphemy. Um, they don't consider you to be an infidel for bringing that up. They know the situation, they know the score. There are certain people that they don't want to have in their countries. Um, but of course, because the West is scared 
of, uh, you know, it's so scared of uh, not appearing woke, not appearing politically correct, and appearing to be what they call Islamophobic. Again, that's one of those Orwellian f words, one of those new speak words that really, really pisses me off because, look, if we've had a couple of planes go through skyscrapers, again, truthers out there, shut up, I'm not taking a position here, but the official story tells us that happened, right? If we've had suicide bombs in trains, again, truthers, shut up, that's not my point. If we've had van attacks, knife attacks, if we've had um, lorries ploughing into people, we've had beheadings, we've had stabbings, we've had all sorts of things going on. Then, you know, and uh, there's the old phrase about if it looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, waddles like a duck, etc. Then, you know, why, you might be asking, are not the moderates speaking out against this? Well, maybe they're scared as well themselves. But in the Western world, we had um, a thing called the rule of law. We have a thing called political individualism, the concept of the human being being sovereign, a sovereign entity, and um, every human being being equal before what you would say God, at least in the Christian context, right? But now we've got a problem that the West is too scared to do anything about. And so there are a lot of bad actors in that situation. And it's a problem, a problem that we can't talk about. And they want to bring in more hate speech laws to make it that you cannot criticise this. I'd have no problem with a post-Reformation Islam in the future where an Imam who was respected by the entire Muslim community around the world who'd managed to unite them against all the different warring factions came out and publicly declared a fatwa against the violent verses of the Quran. I'd have no problem if it could reform itself and evolve to a point where it is agreed upon by the entire Islamic world that it was to coexist peacefully with Christianity, paganism, atheism, Hinduism and all of the other religions. I'd have no problem then with it. If it could evolve into a, uh, you know, if it could actually evolve into a, a religion of peace, I'd have no problem with the existence of Islam. But. When all the scary things happen in the name of extreme Islamism, and then you have governments telling you you can't be Islamophobic because it's a hate crime, then it does make you wonder what the hell is going on. It does make you wonder what are they trying to do? Are they actually pulling a, a George Orwell 1984 thing on us? Are they using 1984 as a, you know, as a, as a manual? Because it does make you wonder. They seem to be fucking up language um, and making it so we can't clearly communicate about any of this stuff, right? And tell us that we are haters. When, you know, I, I don't particularly want to project hate onto any um, individual or group myself. Here I am, you know, in the Philippines. It's very different here in the Philippines. There is a 4% Muslim population here. Um, they're all Filipinos. They're not a different race from each other. The other lot are Catholics. And then you have a smattering of people who are a variety of different um, religions. I mean, there's, you know, I think there's uh, Protestant branches of uh, Christianity as well here. But it is quite a religious um, country. But the thing about it, though, is that it's not hell-bent on, you know, conquering this part of the world. It's hell-bent on conquering Europe. The wrong ends, it appears. And there's wrong ends in every religion. There's wrong ends in every group. There's people who, um, you know, have to say, subvert it for bad, um, for, for, you know, for malevolent um, purposes. And this is clearly happening in Europe, and there's no doubt about it that it's clearly happening in Europe. And um, it does make a lot of people very nervous. And as I say, if the moderates could be courageous enough to stand up and say, no, we don't want this here, and enough of them, um, got together and it was safety in numbers and say, no, we, we don't want this here. This isn't w what it was all about. Then that would be one thing. But, you know, nearly 25 years, um, especially like since 9-11. And again, as I say, truth is out there. Shut up the internal dialogue. That's not my point. The point is that within consensus reality, that's the narrative that we are living under. And it has to do with this. It was a turning point in history, and ever since then, it does seem like a hostile takeover is happening. Now, that's one enemy, an enemy without, if you like. Then we have the enemy within, which gets me on to my second bullet point. Woke, completely irredeemable 
And there are no, there, there is nothing, uh, as I say, there, there is no way I'm steel manning any of that. How that is um, being used. As I say, you've got these loonies out there who are sort of, um, you know, turning up at the protests, especially like the Israel and Palestine protests and this side of uh, the atrocity that happened um, last year. Um, yeah, and there's people saying queers for Palestine, things like that. I mean, we've got absolutely no sense of irony, no sense of self-awareness. They're woke, so therefore they're allies of protected groups and all of that. Yet they would be the first people to be thrown off Palestinian roofs. The first people to go. Because within that religious framework, within that, in that cultural framework, they would um, not survive at all. Yet they are definitely being used as useful idiots you know, for this, what appears to be a totalitarian takeover of the Western world. And you think, how can they be so stupid? <laughs> you know, never underestimate the power of stupidity in the human race. You know, that's just the way it goes. So what have they done? I mean, my God, you know, I remember growing up with political correctness and then I start having my doubts about it because I'm thinking, well, look, here I am, right? Uh, you know, I was up, when I was a teenager and I was a freak in the 1980s and I used to go to these clubs and I was surrounded by, you know, what to say, I was surrounded by people who were dressed up in all sorts of stuff, you know, gender bending, freaky clothes. I was, I was finding myself at kicking out time at Trafalgar Square waiting for night buses, talking to people from all sorts of clubs. You know, I had all sorts of conversations with um, gay men who'd come out of the nightclub heaven in Charing Cross. I was surrounded by all of this stuff. I was extremely tolerant. I had no issues with any of these people. I was, um, you know, and I considered myself to be one of the pioneers of that. So now in this age of woke, now that I'm deciding that this um, idea of tolerance and political correctness is being misused and has a malevolent far left agenda to it, I'm being told that I'm a bigot. I'm being told that I'm far right. I knew the far right were bad back in the day. I don't see them as much of an issue as they used to be, in, at least in the UK. No, I, in fact, I would not say that they are the biggest threat, not by any stretch of the imagination. I mean, from what I could tell, back in the day when we had those skinheads and the far right people back then, most of them were idiots and morons. And, um, you know, but they were very dangerous and they were very violent. And uh, most people, you know, we knew who they were. And, uh, you know, we knew to keep them a wide berth if we were in a situation where we had to tolerate any of these people who'd fallen for any of this stuff. It was, you know, grudgingly that we did. But, you know, I mean, we all knew back then that they were wrongins. And, um, you know, so, um, and that hasn't really changed at all. But as I say, when, all, when any ideological form goes bad, then it's bad. So now um, we have this situation where, again, because I was surrounded by people who were gender bending in all sorts of ways back in the 1980s, and I thought nothing of it. I thought, well, fair enough, I have no issue with that. And on an individual to individual basis, I would have no problem with, um, you know, any people who are like that. My problem would be is with these people, if they are suffering from the woke ideology and they're just running that program, then I would have a problem with it. But it would have nothing to do with their gayness, their tranniness, their blackness, their any of you know, any th these things at all. No, I, I'm quite happy to talk to any person of any of these uh, marginalized groups, provided they don't buy hook, line and sinker into the woke ideology. The woke ideology itself and all its different forms to me is irredeemably bad. And these people are the best useful idiots who will be used by all the bad actors. Uh, but as I say, you know how it goes with useful idiots. They're usually the first against the wall when the end game is achieved. That's the thing. So who, what's going to happen? I mean, when the globalist totalitarians take over, or should we say that the, um, the crazy end of the Islamists take over, is that the thing that's going to happen, that the uh, wokey, useful idiots are going to be the first against the war and killed. You just go throughout history and you see that whenever there have been any of these totalitarian takeovers, the idiots who bring chaos in to disturb and disrupt and destroy and demoralise and deconstruct the society that the totalitarians want to have destroyed, well, when they want to bring order in after the chaos has been brought in, they'll kill off the people who brought the chaos in. They'll say to them, right, you've outlived your usefulness now. We don't need you anymore. <laughs> you know, that's usually how it goes. So, 
Um, the Wokies have got, you know, I have no interest in that. And I think anyone who falls for this stuff now, you know, it amazes me how many cowardly celebrities and elites and, you know, pundits and people who are still virtue signaling like that. I think I remember seeing a post by Jamie Oliver going on and saying that he's looking for gender neutral names for his next baby. And I thought, oh God, what the fuck? Shut up. I mean, you know, what the hell are you trying to do? You, you know, I mean, I know, I know he does the cooking, right? But he just, he still wants to be invited to those dinner parties, doesn't he? He doesn't want to be cancelled. And that's all it comes down to. They just have status anxiety. They don't want to be cancelled. So they're just going along to get along with all that bollocks. Because um, they're scared of being social pariahs. But this is terribly cowardly. Because, you know, like I say, if you don't, um, you know, conform a hook, line and sinker to all of the current things that they're all conforming to, eventually you slip up. And when you slip up, um, they'll cancel you anyway. But because it keeps changing and because it's in this constant state of flux, it basically means you will slip up one day and then you will be cancelled because something will take you too far. And that's what happened to JK Rowling. But hey, you know, the thing is that it's good that she's standing up like this. It's good that she's fearless in the way that she is. You know, she used to be a, a feminist. She's definitely a lefty. She still is a feminist, technically, I suppose. Uh, but at the same time, I find it quite ironic that all those man-hating feminists that I remember from when I lived in Totnes will probably be more likely to throw her under the bus while supporting the rights of all autogynophiles who are pervy. How the hell did it come to that? You know, the thing. Again, this is another thing about the woke, right? Now, as I said uh, previously, I've got no problem with um, certain people who I can think of who are male to female trans, such as um, Debbie Hayton, the talking head, who appears on talk radio or GB News. I've got no problem with Blair White either as an individual. But I do understand that there are some bad men out there, talking psychopaths and violent nutters, autogynophiles and stuff like that, that are going on the internet and being intimidating and being threatening. And I know that, um, this is being ignored and you know, you're not allowed to talk about it, but it is a problem that should be spoken about. As I said, you know, it should be that the moderate, um, like I said about the, the moderate Islam people, the polite, nice um, Muslims, should have the courage to stand up against the extreme nutters, but likewise, the good, you know, trans, male to female trans, or female to male trans people that come along that did it for the right reasons that are, you know, okay as human beings should actually stand up against the pervs and the autogynophiles who are trying to hijack their cause. I think it should be. And I think that these conversations should be allowed to be freely had. Because it's quite easy when you think about it to notice that someone is not motivated by hate. And I think I have enough evidence in this video already that I'm not motivated by hate myself at all. Right. Anyway, I've got to go back to my bullet points because I've got to find the next one. So. Let me see. Oh yes, New Age. I want to go on to that now. When I lived in Totnes, and before I lived there as well, um, from about the 1990s onwards, when I kind of like I got out of the whole goth thing and I went into the more crusty hippie thing, and then from there into a lot of the parties and then, you know, from the parties, I think I end up in the side trance, <laughs> in and out of these alternative subcultures, as well as, um, you know, uh, people that I knew, the new age thing was trying to come in. And um, <clears throat> I think the problem with that is that it exists in a world of solipsism. That you manifest everything, man. You know, this goes back to the 1960s, doesn't it? You know, yeah. You manifest everything. So if bad things happen to you, you manifested it. And, you know, it doesn't seem to take into consideration. And I've, I've found this problem with a lot of these people that no you don't manifest everything because other people might be out manifesting you for a start and if someone wants to come up to you and hit you they, they want to tell you well you manifested it with your aura and all of that bollocks right it borrowed from eastern mythology from buddhism hinduism it borrowed from uh, paganism and stuff like that and created a very shallow and a very silly you know um, low resolution version of that and you know, I thought it would be good to go to places like Avebury and Glastonbury and Totnes, only to find that I'd be disappointed by a lot of these people who are living in small tribal worlds. 
They'd be a bit more pagan in Avebury. They'd be a bit more pagan in Glastonbury. Most of them that I found um, in, in Totnes were more erring towards the Buddhist side. But again, when I met any of these people, I was trying to talk to them about a, a variety of other subjects that, you know, because my idea is that we should be able to, you know, look at everything, talk about everything, understand everything, one thing in, you know, perspective to another thing. And I found that most people couldn't do it. And I found that I was being off script within their conformity of a second order. And if anything, um, I found that these people actually made me feel worse, like they were stealing from me, you know? And they were living in a very, as I say, solipsistic world that had nothing to do with reality and were quite lost. And just like the Wokies, with a lot of them, you know, there's a crossover between New Age and Woke, most definitely, isn't there not, right? Um, most of these people just kind of expanded that thing that's got to be known as the God-shaped hole. Now, whether you believe in God or not, I consider myself to be agnostic, I have a concept of what I consider to be a God-shaped hole, right? And a certain ideological takeover, a two-pronged one, one coming from woke and one coming from radical Islamism, gets into the Western culture via the God-shaped hole. Because, um, you know, I mean, I kind of agree with uh, Frederick Nietzsche on this, that, you know, I don't think religion is a great idea any kind whatsoever um, I you know I, I'm quite happy to do without it but at the same time I do see and especially no, it's noticeable here in the Philippines where it's quite a traditional and very old-fashioned place it's very Catholic right it does seem that it, it it acts as a cultural glue keeps people together keeps people socially cohesive and if a god-shaped hole appeared here this place would just go to shit in the same way spiritually that the West has gone to shit it would just mean that other entities could come in and take over and um, people would, uh, would feel empty. So the concept of the God-shaped hole, yeah, I understand that. And I kind of think that like, um, well, one attempt to try to fill the God-shaped hole that I see that might work is um, through paganism, at least in the UK, because, you know, you have the stone circles, you have all these places, you have the solstices and equinoxes. At those latitudes, it works perfectly. It goes perfect with the climate that you're in. But again, the other problem that I have is that, you know, last time I was on Facebook and I saw people at Stonehenge celebrating, you know, uh, spring equinox or whatever, there's the same old usual subject, suspects, Arthur Pendragon and his war band of pissheads and stuff like that. There's this priestly class that tries to put itself at the top of it all by dressing in all these robes and I have no time for that. And um, I find that I, I just found I could not deal with these people, I couldn't really talk to them. I felt that, uh, you know, um, it's just the same thing. It's just another social hierarchy, it's just another tribe. And, um, you know, um, it's very easy to feel um, unanchored and ungrounded uh, amongst all these people too. So again, you know, um, I find that I found that I was very lost in that and I really truly lost myself in that. And I kind of think a lot of shadow stuff got into me as a result of that, you know. <laughs> so I've got to go on to my next list on my bullet points. The next one, of course, is um, I'm going to put these together, actually, conservatism and Christianity. In recent years, as the far left has become too loony left, and as the God-shaped hole has become uh, bigger, as the problem of woke has become more of a problem, as the problem of, um, you know, the nutters who are like the radical Islamists who come in, as I say, certain prosperous um, Islamic countries won't even have those nutters in, but Europe has to have them all in because it's so scared to be racist. And um, the wokies are aligning themselves with that. As a result, um, human beings being tribal, have tried to create a counterpoise to it. So there has been um, a rise in the alternative uh, media and uh, a lot of the people who are not part of the woke thing to try to form a tribe as a counterpoise to that. And so conservatism and Christianity are attempting to fill these shoes. Now I've kind of noticed that like in, you know, recently a lot of people in the alternative media and stuff like that, as well as a lot of people, you know, they're, they're all talking about how they're more conservative than they used to be, how much more Christian than they used to be. 
But all I have to do is to go back in time to the 1990s. And, you know, the, the left didn't really have much of a voice. The political right had more of the voice, right up until, right up until you know, the time even of 9-11 and Tony Blair and Iraq and all of that. It was the centre-right and the, the people they called the neocons who had the voice back then. And some weird flippening happened that most people do seem to not be aware of. And as a result, there seem to be people on the other side, you know, the, 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 the modern day counterculture who decided to become conservative and Christian. They wouldn't, dream, they wouldn't have dreamed of being that back in the day because they saw that as a problem itself. And so now I'm just seeing all these tribes that look like they're equally blue pill, matrix, preset tribes, or whatever, pointing fingers at each other and telling each other that they're asleep and that I'm awake and all of that. And I look at this and I think, well, it does seem very strange to me, you know, how this has come about. As I say, um, I've met many good Christians and I'm quite happy to have conversations with them. Um, when it comes to the concept of a cultural Christian, well, you know, I suppose you know, even Richard Dawkins has admitted to that. I'm going to get onto atheism later, right? Even Richard Dawkins has admitted to that. Right, so um, I suppose that must make me one as well even though I don't consider myself to be religious, but I grew up within the shadow and the framework of forms of Christianity. And um, as I said previously, I decided to uh, re-watch the miniseries from the 1970s, Jesus of Nazareth. I'm going to watch it again, actually. Um, in the process of doing that, all I noticed was that there was a bunch of ideologues all trying to come along and cling on to Jesus and use him for their cause. And he was kind of like, I'm not going along with any of it. He was just very much free, you know? In, in the way that he was, and um, he'd talk to anyone, wouldn't judge anyone, and um, there was all these people with all their different rigid orthodoxies around him, and he was the only one who wasn't like that. And I kind of don't think that any Christians um, today are behaving like Jesus. No, they're behaving like Christians in the sense that, that the God botherers, they're not behaving like Jesus. If it comes to things like, you know, common decency, you know, not judging people, that sort of thing, um, he who is without sin cast the first stone. Well, I'm all on board with that. But then, you know, there's people like Calvin Robinson. Well, he's all right, you know, sometimes I like him, but he has got a little bit fire and brimstone recently. Um, then there's James Dellingpole, who's become very, like, he's, he's kind of like, I don't know how to describe it, but he's kind of like David Icke as a god botherer. <laughs> he fell out with David Icke recently as well, which is quite funny. But he's just as down the rabbit holes as David Icke but he's also gone full on God botherer. And then there's my friend Lou Collins who's got, become very Christian as well. Now, I don't, like I say, I've got nothing against Lou. I would quite happily have a conversation with her about this, you know, just to see how it goes. Because, um, you know, I mean, right, that's what she wants to be, then fair enough. I, I, I can't say that, you know, it's, as I say, always say in this channel, it's your model, you model it as you wish. It's your reality, you model it as you wish. But the trouble is, I can't go along with any of these things. I just can't. I will take on certain elements of certain things and I'll try to tailor make them towards my more um, bespoke reality model that I myself want to do, you know. But the thing is, um, human beings, being human beings, being tribal, I just can't go along with that. And as I said, I've um, been looking at the whole Ken Wilber thing, you know, and I kind of think that I'm, I'm in the process of going from green and orange into the yellow world. So I kind of feel like I'm very much an individual, very much detached from what's going on in the human race and very much kind of getting into a, what I would consider to be a post-tribal state. But I see most of the people online regressing into these old legacy forms, right? And it just bothers me. You know, if you want to be conservative and Christian, you ain't going to get past the 1950s. The 1960s happened for a reason. Rock and roll happened for a reason. Yes, maybe it was the beginning of the, you know, the end or the beginning of sort of decadence within our civilization. But at the same time, that old world that existed before then, the 1950s, we couldn't have been in that for long. That was born out of war, you know? That's the thing. So what happened in the 1960s was born out of peace. But naturally, we'd have been hijacked by the wrong people. And then as a result of us losing our way, a God-shaped hole would have been opened. And now we're facing hostile takeover from outside with the nutters from the Middle East and inside from the people who went too far down the rabbit holes of communism and postmodernism. Right. And then, of course, well, 
there is another thing, and that's the atheists. I've got, I saved them till last, didn't I? I didn't mean to save them till last. But I was watching an interview with Richard Dawkins and Ricky Gervais um, recently. And you know the thing about it is that, yeah, I, I, I can understand people not wanting to be, um, you know, slaves to ideology and religion. But I couldn't help but feel that there was some sort of, something like a quasi-religious orthodoxy that seemed to exist within the atheist thing. They're all coming from this perspective of it's all science, it's all hard science, it's all Darwinism, it's all evolution. And they were so sure that they never existed before and now they're alive and, and they'll never exist again. And I can't accept that because there's a part of me that's thinking, well, we don't know what happens to the consciousness when it leaves our body, whether it even stays in an autonomous form. We don't actually know one way or the other. We have no way of measuring it. It's beyond the realm of science and it's in the domain of philosophy, all of this stuff. We have no scientific measuring instruments to be sure of it. So I just sort of think to myself that, you know, as we can't prove nor disprove God, as we can't prove or disprove the, the afterlife or any of this, this is not a place for scientists to even bother with, right? This is just philosophy and nothing else. But the atheists act like they are, you know, the post-enlightenment gatekeepers of hard science when it comes to stuff like this. This consciousness does disappear when I die, and I don't have any form of materialism, if you like, in the form of a brain for me to be conscious in. Then what's to say that I don't go to the same nothing that I was in before I was born, and therefore I might re-emerge and re-embodied in another form of consciousness. Maybe the Hindus are right. Maybe reincarnation is a thing. So, you know, when it comes to belief, I'm very much like Robert Anton Wilson in that way. Belief ain't enough. You can suppose things, but don't believe. You can know things or not know things, but don't believe. Believe, basically, as the word lie in the middle of it, and I think that's a clue. I am, now that might be an ideological perspective that I come from. Excuse the noise around me here. It's quite noisy, um, but I'm hoping that this microphone is not uh, too sensitive. It's not, actually not too bad, really. So anyway, back to what I was saying. I've come to the conclusion that I must be agnostic. I don't know a lot of stuff. I've no idea. And when I look at all the people who are very, very, you know, have so much conviction that they're right about their model of reality, that it's absolute, whether they're Christian, whether they're Muslim, whether they're atheist, whether they're, they say they're in the matrix or out the matrix, whether they're politically this way or politically that way, I just sort of think that we as human beings have got a lot of evolving to do. We're still not where we should be. And I, I just sort of feel like uh, we are definitely still within the adolescence of, of our being. We have so much greater to be. Maybe um, Nietzsche was right. Maybe we do need to become an Ubermensch. But at the, at the moment, we wouldn't really have a concept of what that would be like. So we can't really judge what that would be based on any of our fears, right? Because, and we can't idealize it from where we are now because we're not at a level of consciousness to even be able to comprehend it. But I am, by the way I think, able to contemplate the, the, the fact that I am not at the level of consciousness to understand where I aspire to be. But I know there is something better than this, which I do aspire to be. It's inconceivable, but I can conceive the concept of inconceivability, what's the way I am at the moment. And one of the tools that I think would help us get there is, if we could find a way of being able to transcend all of these epistemological cartoons, right? <laughs> uh, if we could just do that, you know, if we could reclaim our moral compass, maybe act like God exists, I can understand what Jordan Peterson said when he said that, because there could be a God, but maybe we've um, anthropomorphized him into an old man with a beard sitting behind the clouds. Maybe we are in an analog computer matrix of sorts, you know, maybe an analog quantum computer matrix, and God is the architect of this matrix. And, um, you know, so therefore I'm kind of thinking, well, if we've fucked up, is there, it's, I don't know, what is it? It's bugs in the system. Mate, but the universe um, and everything in it, and that's planet, all of it, does seem to be a construct of sorts. It does seem to be intelligently designed to me, right? So there's, you know, so it doesn't seem to be a random accident. But I don't think of it, um, you know, in that old way of thinking. It could be just a kind of analog quantum computer program that we find ourselves in you know something that makes itself and evolves itself over time 
And I feel as a result of that, I've developed my own bespoke ideology that fits nicely between Christianity and atheism. But I'm agnostic because I don't know. I don't claim to know. There's so much I can't know. There's so much in the realm of the unknowable that I wouldn't even know where to begin. And that's the place where I'm coming from. So when I look at um, the world and I look at all this bollocks about hate, say so, you know, on one side, or this stuff about what God is or what God isn't, or you know, all these silly prejudices that people have, or all these you know, people who are crying like victims because, oh, this person hates me because of my this or because of my that. It's just like infantile to me. All of it is. I just think that we've got to become better than this. So can we become better than this? Can we find a way of being able to transcend all of these silly epistemological cartoons in a way that doesn't create a God-shaped hole? Can we do that? Can we somehow attach our moral compass to some universal cosmic thing or order that doesn't require us to be a member of an orthodox religion. And if we have to model it differently from each other, can we find uh, a common ground to get us together? Now I'm all up for, you know, how could I say, the cultural artifacts of the religions that created our society. And there's lots of debates, well, if you get, they say, they say to you, if you get rid of Christianity, but you want to keep the, the you, want, you want to keep the churches, there's that argument that's going on at the moment. Again, I think of that as a false dichotomy. What matters to me is not that. What matters to me is that if a culture wants to stay the culture that it is and not have it threatened or undermined by something hostile taking it over, it has to identify the root causes of all of that. But at the same time, if we are evolving into something new, and if ultimately all change is good, but we just have a few bad bits to go over, you know, because of ebbs and flows, then I hope we get there. And I hope this does make us evolve to something better than this. You know? Um, I don't know what else to say apart from all of that, but I would be interested in people to leave comments below, you know? Because I think all of this is really important. I've gone, um, this is a long video. I've spoken about quite a lot of stuff, but this, what happens, on the odd occasion, I get these brainstorms and then I mean, sometimes I don't and sometimes I'm just doing filler episodes. But hey, I hope um, this was, um, as I say, not just food for thought, but an entire banquet for thought for you. Right then, see you later, alligator. See you soon, baboon. If you like this content, don't forget to like, subscribe and share. And while you're at it, check out all our social media links. Please help this channel grow. Your help will be appreciated.